Does this one work? Does that work? Okay. Um, so Aaron's going to put pull up some slides. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give exactly the same talk John gave, except <laughs> John assures me this is not repetition. This is reinforcement. Um, the Marine Carbon Project was was pulled together in, in about 2007. We started talking amongst sort of the major ag organizations in Marin County about climate change and um, and what role agriculture might might play in in this equation. So um, the Marin RCD, um, if you go back, Aaron, go back. To that. Yeah, um, the Marin RCD, um, Malt. Uh, UC Berkeley, Dr. Wendy Silver's lab, Natural Resources Conservation Service out of Petaluma, um, John Peggy, of course, um, with uh, the Native Grass Ranch in Nicasio, um, our local UC Extension office, uh, all involved, uh, myself and others involved, in, in really trying to get a handle on this question. Um, really, the basic question being, can management enhance carbon sequestration in Marin's agricultural soils. And then sort of the follow-on question to that is, what happens if we do that? What are the, what are those good or bad effects of, of doing that? Next. As John pointed out, um, this is driven by what to me is a very, John finds exciting, I find extremely alarming um, <laughs> change. In, and then that's why we're a good team. Um, <laughs> Uh, shift in, in, the, in global um, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, um, absolutely unprecedented in anything remotely close to human history. Um, so we are truly in deep trouble, and John's already explained this, but um, it's, it's this that drove the formation of the project. So next slide. Um, well, one thing we do know, and this is from Dr. Alan Flint, who John mentioned earlier, um, that that shift in atmospheric CO2 is absolutely being driven by us. We, there are all kinds of other things going on, volcanoes and other things that contribute to global warming, global cooling, and increases and decreases in atmospheric CO2, but it is our fossil fuel emissions and land management practices that are driving that upward curve. Part of that is this ongoing downward spiral of, of soil degradation that's been happening for a very long time. And of course, throughout human history, we've watched fertile soils used, used up, and abandoned, and desertified. Um, that's the story of agriculture. Um, basically, a process of, of cultivation, oxidizing soil carbon, changing soil microbial populations, reducing soil aggregation and water holding capacity, decreasing soil drainage, causing more compaction, requiring more tillage, and on it goes until we're left with nothing. Next slide. This is what's happened globally. Um, this is where we are right now. Uh, the state of our soils globally. Pretty alarming state of affairs. The only soils that don't appear to be degraded are the ice caps and the deserts, which were already desertified. Next slide. And concomitant with this is the development of what are being called dead zones all around our coastlines. If you can imagine that we have this much dead material on our living biosphere, I'm very alarmed. I'm very alarmed. And these are the most serious dead zones. I don't know what the non-serious dead zones might be like, but this is to me extremely alarming. Next slide. And as John suggested, this is really because we don't understand the carbon cycle. We are totally dependent upon it, we engage with it every day, and we don't understand it. But it's pretty simple. There's a finite amount of carbon on Earth. It's basically located within five different major carbon pools, and as it moves between those pools, it changes form. And the, the two major pools that we're concerned about here, or three, is, is this fossil fuel pool, which is pulling deep, sequestered carbon from before that 800,000 year cycle, um, laid down by massive forests and 
massive animals that laid down huge deposits of coal and oil. They took that, all that carbon out of the air and they, they sequestered it for us so that we could come along, right, and spew it back into the atmosphere again. We're forgetting about the living biosphere, the vegetation and the soils. And it's a soil pool that is not only a pretty large pool, but it's the one pool along with vegetation that has the capacity to absorb that excess beneficially. We don't want to put more carbon dioxide in the, into the oceans as we're now doing and acidifying our oceans to the point where our shellfish can't survive. We don't want to put it into the atmosphere, obviously. That's, that's going to cook us off the face of the earth. So it's the soils and the vegetation that are the, the open pools, if you will, available for us to sequester this carbon. And we, and we can do it beneficially. Next, please. So it turns out that reducing our emissions, which we absolutely have to do, is not going to save our butts because we're already, we were on this cycle where atmospheric CO2 is increasing, and we've kicked some processes into gear, including the melting of polar ice caps, the initiation of the melting of the permafrost, um, the release of methane from, from our fracking practices and so forth, that is going to continue whether or not we're burning fossil fuels. We have to do something to bend that curve in the other direction. We, need, we have to pull CO2 out of the air. Next. Um, the good news is that plants can do that. And, and so we have a mechanism, as John's outlined, that we can actually begin to engage with. And, and one of the interesting things about the Keeling curve, aside from the terrifying rate at which it's going up, there's this intra-annual fluctuation. This, every year we see this rise and fall in atmospheric CO2. It's about a six part per million flux that happens every single year. And it's a function of the northern hemisphere deciduous forests leafing out Miraculous, right? The trees leaf out and absorb all of the CO2, and it's huge inhaling of CO2 every spring. And also phytoplankton in the northern Pacific, this huge phytoplankton bloom that's again absorbing all the CO2. Fall comes, trees drop their leaves, decomposition takes place, most of that CO2 is re-respired re to the atmosphere. But we see, we see the mechanism operative, okay, so it, it gives us some hope next. Rangelands, huge, huge, as John mentioned, huge piece of the global land base. Um, 30 to 50% of the global land area is classified as rangeland. Most of that is, in fact, is managed. It's managed by, by human beings with their livestock and or large wild grazing ungulates or other, other large grazing animals. Um, it's about 50% of the U.S. is classified as rangelands and roughly 23 million hectares of California. Next, please. Grasses do a great job, as John so beautifully illustrated, of allocating a very large part of their photosynthate below ground. And below ground is where we want to put this carbon because we, we don't want it re-respiring right away. We want to hang on to that carbon as long as we can. And in fact, most of the world's truly productive agricultural soils are on grasslands. It's the grasses and the grazing animals on those grasslands that built, and fire, typically, um, that built those deep, fertile soils those 30, 40, 60 foot deep soils in the Great Plains that we're, we're, um, we're farming today, true in, in uh, Russia and, and all over the planet. Um, next, please. In California, um, we have about 23 million hectares of rangeland and about 38 million acres are actually grassland or pasture in California. Um, we have a lot of rangeland that's, say, hardwood rangeland that includes it's sort of more savanna-like. We also classify many of our forest lands in California as rangelands. But in terms of just pure grasslands and pastures, we're looking at about 38 million acres. Next, please. This is some data both from the Marine Carbon Project on the right side of the slide and, and from California generally on the left. Um, Dr. Silver and others uh, look, did a literature review of California rangeland soil carbon, looking for evidence um, in the literature. And came up with this pretty dramatic spread from about 30 to about 130 metric tons of carbon in California's rangeland soils generally. Marin County was a few sample sites in Sonoma. We saw a very similar curve, but a little more 
uh, a little more than that, typically about 50 to, uh, to 250 tons of carbon in our soils and we're in. Um, probably we're a little higher than the average because of our music being a really moderated climate with being on the coast and a lot of intact perennial grasslands still in Marin. Next, please. Um, what's interesting, as, as John mentioned, um, when we looked at the Marin soil uh, data, we, we found a distinct break between soils that were, that had been amended, in this, in, mostly with manures, and those that had not been, which were more extensively managed rangelands, which is, of course, more typical of our, of our county rangelands. Um, pretty dramatic difference um, of about, what would we have there, about a, about 100, 100 tons difference between the amended soils and the unamended. Next slide. Um, and as John mentioned too, the, the even more interesting was the fact that some of that carbon was in these long-term fractions, in the occluded light fraction and in the heavy fraction. So this carbon is not carbon that's going to re-respire next year. It's carbon that's going to be there for decades, centuries, even millennia if that ground isn't plowed up. Next, please. So we went ahead with the experiment and we put half an inch of compost out um, in 2008. And we really, the real challenge here was to measure this because we knew that even if we might theoretically be able to increase soil carbon, could we measure it? And if we couldn't measure it, how would we really be able to say we'd done it? How would we even begin to think about marketing carbon on the carbon market if we couldn't measure it? Um, and then of course this pressing question of what happens, what happens to the system if we actually do succeed in increasing soil carbon? What are the implications of that? Next, please. Okay, so the first thing that we saw was a 50% a increase in forage production. And this was true both on, in the Marin site, on John and Peggy's ranch, but it was also true in the Sierra Foothills. In fact, uh, the UC research station in, in the Sierra Foothills show, show, showed an even greater um, increase in, um, in forage production. So good signs, you know, very, very great, and great signs in terms of if you're a livestock producer, um, Really good news to see this happen. So next, please. We also saw an increase in soil carbon. So uh, the, the bar on the left is pre-treatment conditions. And then you see the three years of data presented here. This trend, as John pointed out, is continuing. Um, there's variation with rainfall and, and above ground productivity over the, over the course of the experiment. But the, the net effect of this continuing increase in soil carbon throughout the course of the experiment. You plug this data into the Century Ecosystem Carbon Model, which is one of the most widely used ecosystem carbon models. Um, and this is work from Becca Riles, who actually did her dissertation on the Marine Carbon Project research. Um, and all the data is from Becca, I should say. Um, this actually looks like this carbon increase is gonna continue for up to 100 years. So we get this initial dramatic spike and then a gradual tapering off over time as that one time, one time application of half an inch of compost manifests itself, both in the, in the light fraction, the, the intermediate fraction, and the, and the occluded fraction, all of them showing a, a total overall increase over that long period of time. Next slide, please. So Dr. Marcia Delange, who's a, an ecosystem ecologist who did a life cycle assessment for us on this. In other words, that's great, we increased carbon, but as, as the manure question raises, what are the greenhouse gas costs of making compost and spreading compost and transporting compost and, and grazing livestock on these lands? What are, what's the, what are the total life cycle implications of this practice? And actually, it, it turns out to be even more exciting because if we're making compost from materials that have been um, diverted from landfills, where they would decompose anaerobically and produce methane, or from, say, our anaerobic manure lagoons, where we're storing much of our manure these days in California and, and, and the world, we, we avoid those methane emissions, and that adds a huge amount of, of carbon that's not being emitted. So we get a huge avoided emission benefit of compost, aerobically composting and then land applying that material. For a net effect of about 38 metric tons per hectare, year one, of course, because the avoidance values, those avoid avoidance credits only come one time. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a huge amount of carbon sequestered per hectare. And if you, if you look at that over um, 
the total county of Marin, just Marin, now our 65,000 um, hectares of rangeland in Marin County, we're looking at a, upwards of um, uh, something like uh, two million, two and a half million tons of, of avoided um, CO2 emissions, effectively, if we were able to do this on all of Marin's rangelands, which of course we couldn't, but nevertheless, it's an interesting thought experiment. Next, next slide. Again, um, the water implications of this turn out to be very exciting as well, and it may in fact be this water that's driving all of this, because by, by adding carbon to the system, we captured more water, we held more water, we drove more plant growth. And, and so we saw, here we see about a 15% increase in the volumetric water content, how much water was in the soil on the treated plots. Um, as John mentioned, then, next slide, we handed that data to Dr. Alan Flint, who's a USGS hydrologist, who's been looking at the, what's, what's coming for California hydrologically um, and agriculturally over the next century in the face of changing climate. And this is a trend um, in the Alexander Valley, uh, which draws its irrigation water from the Russian River. This is just looking at a segment of the Russian River, the implications of climate change and water withdrawal. And you can see this rising demand for irrigation water um, in the face of the status quo right now. Next slide. So Dr. Flint plugged becker Ryle's data into his models and he saw basically a 6.5% decrease in demand from, for irrigation by applying the amount of compost that we had applied to, and these are irrigated vineyards. Um, the net effect of this was a reduction in overall demand from the Russian River for the 30,000 acre Alexander Valley of 450 acre feet of water a year, which is a heck of a lot of water. And if you think about that for the whole state of California, it adds up to probably more water than we can hold in all of our reservoirs. So if we start to think of our soils as our primary water reservoir, and we start to think about managing them for water holding capacity, this becomes a very significant. So the carbon, the carbon project has kind of moved on. We moved beyond research now. We're moving into implementation. And um, we're taking this to scale. Um, starting this fall, we, we identified um, three ranches to work with directly. We had, I think, 15 ranches very interested in working with us, and we had very limited resources. In fact, we had enough resources to work with one. But we're working with three, and we're looking at, one, implementing the compost practice at scale, but we're also looking at other practices. And the Natural Resources Conservation Service has identified 25 of their standard conservation practices that they regard as carbon beneficial. So we'll be incorporating that list into our carbon planning process. Uh, but basically the idea is to develop a plan for each ranch that maximizes its potential to capture carbon. Whether those plans get implemented or not will depend on whether we get the funding to do that. But the planning process at least will identify and hopefully quantify the potential maximum amount of carbon that could be sequestered on any given piece of land. Next, please. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like going to scale. It was really fun to get all this compost on the ground. Um, very exciting. We, we actually only covered about 100 acres on the total on the three ranchers. Took, that was, it took some doing, believe me. And it ate up just about all the compost we had at the West Marin Compost Project in Acacia. Again, we're, we're testing, we're also testing a quarter inch application because, again, the, the um, century model suggests that the half inch might not have been necessary. We might have been able to get away with a quarter inch. And if, obviously that lets us double the land area we could treat any given year. Okay, so here's some numbers, um, and they're really just illustrative, but it's sort of the outcome of thought experiments we've been playing around with. Um, do we have enough compost in California to actually do this? Um, right now, we're, we're bearing about um, 15 million tons of compostable organics in our landfills every year in California. I guess it's fun to do, I'm not sure. We also have an awful lot of um, uh, manures that are either in anaerobic lagoons or not being optimally utilized, causing water quality problems, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of potential organics available. So we're looking at possibly 33 million metric tons of, of materials um, of compost that we could produce each year, um, which 
if we were able to apply that, uh, which basically would let us cover a quarter of the state's rangelands every on a sort of a 17 to 40 year cycle, um, we could sequester just from the enhanced photosynthesis, just from the plant response, we would be looking at about 23 teragrams, teragram being a million metric tons. Um, or if we include those avoided emissions, we're talking about 330 teragrams of CO2 each year. And so just for comparison there, there's some of the, in blue are the emissions currently being put out by these various sectors, the livestock, the commercial and residential sector, and the electrical generation sector. So it actually looks really good um, if we can scale this up. Next. So of course the hanging question here is what about grazing? Because rangelands are grazed and we're not going to get compost out everywhere, at least not every year. So how do we manage livestock or can we manage livestock to capture more carbon? Next. So what we do know and this is from ecosystem science and it's well established and well understood that we manage ecosystem change by managing the scale of ecosystem disturbance in space and time. And, and this is a picture of John and Peggy moving cows on their ranch. And you can look at the landscape behind them and you can imagine the difference between managing animals this way and just opening the gate and letting those cows wander around that landscape 365 days a year. As opposed to be, being, with, as opposed for the two hours they spent on this piece of ground once a year. Okay, next. Um, this is kind of a, a fantasy model that, for me, tries to illustrate um, where we might how we might go in the other direction as far as building soil uh, with a disturbance such as compost application or a grazing event. Um, basically, enabling the system to capture more carbon stored in the soil, that increase in soil carbon then driving an increase in vegetation production, allowing the next disturbance to capture a little more carbon, sequestering that in the soil, and gradually ratcheting the system up through a series of timed, intentional, properly scaled disturbance events such as grazing. Next. We're already doing this at the global scale. It's not serving us very well because we're not doing it intentionally or intelligently or knowledgeably. We're actually driving the system in exactly the wrong direction. It's driven by fossil fuels, driving us toward global ecological collapse. But essentially, this concept of deviation amplifying positive feedbacks, driving system change, is exactly what we're talking about when we look at using compost or using grazing impacts to move the system in the direction we want to go. Next. So grazing systems, I mean, sorry, rangeland systems evolved under grazing, most of them, which suggests that there is, in fact, a role for grazing animals in rangeland systems. Next. This is a uh, sort of a global analysis done by Conant and Paucian out of Colorado State looking at the potential, the existing potential right now, today, rangeland potential for carbon capture uh, from both negative and positive. They're, they've estimated up to about a ton per hectare of carbon capture potential on rangelands per year. Next slide. Um, these are sort of their best case scenarios, uh, one to up to almost four tons of, of carbon capture, CO2 equivalent uh, capture. Uh, if we scale this on California's rangelands, we're looking at up to 42 teragrams of CO2 equivalent annually. Um, just from improved grazing practices that are well-known, well-established, and non-controversial. Um, the question, though, is can we do better? And I think the Marine Carbon Project has given us the tools and the understanding to realize that, that this is really the bottom of what can be done on rangelands, which is great, and we need to do it because we're not even doing this on most of our rangelands today. But the potential is much, much greater. Next slide. Um, if we look at... Um, global or California mitigation potential just from a, an improved grazing compost combination. Um, basically, we're looking at maybe a 32, 32 metric ton per hectare net benefit. Um, 
with the combined practices, and then there are all the other practices that we might add to this. For example, UC Extension is doing work now with the carbon cop capture potential in riparian restoration projects and showing a significant gain in carbon. As you might imagine, taking a degraded gully system and, and reestablishing riparian vegetation and making that a functional, healthy ecosystem. Next slide. And so where this comes to roost, as Rebecca so beautifully um, pointed out this morning in her opening remarks, um, the question is how then do our industries, including the fiber industry and the fiber, the fiber world, um, think about doing, doing fiber production in a way that is, in fact, carbon beneficial. And I think the Carbon Project is bringing some of those tools to the table, and we're really looking forward to, to continuing this discussion. So, next. Time for questions? Or? Yes, there's time for questions. And could you just uh, reflect a little bit more on this slide that if we were to do this on 5% of California's rangelands, it would offset what in terms of our emissions, just in one sentence? Yeah, maybe? well, I would need to go back to the slide because I'm not carrying these numbers around in my head, I assure you. Um, but just think about all the emissions that we're producing and uh, traveling It's actually one of the last slides, actually, I think. It gets shown um, a different amount. Yeah, there's a couple different, but keep going down. It's, yep. it's, I think keep it's going. Here, let's, there it yeah, is. Yeah, there we go. Okay, great. So, um, so the, five percent the of the rangelands. Yeah, the thinking here was when we when we actually looked at an annual compost application, looking at the compost we could make, not not that we right now today have the capacity to make because we're still burying this stuff, it's still making methane out of it, but if we capture it and we aerobically compost it and we get it out onto our rangelands, we could cover about 5% of our rangelands every year, which is pretty darn good, assuming we had the, logistical, the logistics in place to do that and the cooperating ranches. Um, so if we look at improved grazing practices, because there's not a lot of point in putting compost out onto rangelands that aren't going to be properly grazed, although we actually saw perfectly amazing responses in essentially average range conditions. Um, we're looking at about 32, 32 metric tons per hectare. Actually, as that's presented there, um, we're looking at million uh, uh, tons per hectare avoided and sequestered a net of about 32 million metric tons, 32 metric tons per hectare. So that's a big number and um, again, scaled up it, it's very significant. It, if we look, need a total for that, we'll, we'll have to go one of the one of the earlier slides. So it could sequester California's emissions. It could sequester all of our all of our commercial and energy production emissions. Yes. Yeah. All commercial and energy emissions yeah. could be. And sequestered. and the livestock emissions as well. And livestock yeah. emissions. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, the, and I would say here that um, the compost application, I. I as fixated as we are on that, because it's so powerful, um, is just kind of opens the door to the understanding that if we can increase soil carbon, we can increase soil carbon. And that's, that's what's exciting, is that we open the door to the mechanism that allows us to initiate this, as Rebecca said earlier, this spiral, this beneficial spiral of increasing soil fertility, increasing water holding capacity, and decreasing atmospheric CO2. So the, co the compost practice is, is wonderful. I personally love compost. It's really my life. But, you know, there's, there's, there's riparian restoration. There's just all the things that go into making land care part of our lives and, and so devastatingly absent from the equation, as I showed you in those two slides at the beginning. We are in deep trouble. And it, we need an entire, we need a revolution in the way we think about ourselves and our relationship with the planet. And we all know that. And that's why I'm so delighted to be here. Are there any questions for Jeff? Yeah, I'd like to ask a meta question. Uh, one of the, I'd like to ask a, meta, a couple of meta questions, one at an academic level, the other at a more uh, societal level. The academic one is, 
has anybody put together a bibliography of this stuff? Because it would be really interesting to have a look at that. Second of all, there is the job of selling this as a project to the state of California, which then becomes a model for the rest of the country, just Absolutely. as many other cultural goodies have arrived. And I wondered what your thoughts were. Uh, obviously, John was talking about how the state of California, because of its use of rangelands and possession of them, could be part of that process. But at some time, presumably, it's going to get political. In, and so then I wonder if you've had any thoughts or discussions about that more social, political dimension of the situation? Answering that question first, we absolutely do. We're very engaged, and Tori's going to speak directly to that, so I'll, I'll let him cover it, which he does so well. Um, in terms of bibliography, there are a whole lot of bibliographies out there. Um, I have one, uh, Dr. Silver has one, uh, Becca, all of the researchers involved in this have their you know, bibliographies associated with the aspect of the research that they're engaged with. So um, as far as a comprehensive list of reading material that we might put on the Marine Carbon website, I think that's a fantastic suggestion. So thank you. I had a question regarding uh, the compost application. How is it comparable to the high density grazing that we saw in the, the pasture uh, John, that you had those animals. What was the density um, in that one or that small plot? And you said there was only two hours you had them in there. So my question is, the compost application, if we managed our animals on land, are we going to be able to see that comparable compost application? That's a great question. We, um, we, in our experiments, we graze all of our plots, our control plots and our compost plots. Our control plots all lost carbon even as we were gaining carbon on the treated plots. Now, we've been, we continue to follow the grazed control plots, and for the first time last year, after six years, we actually saw, we measured an increase in above ground biomass on those plots, on the grazed plots relative to the ungrazed plots. In order to increase soil carbon, we probably need to increase overall biomass production. Now, it took six years to see an increase in biomass production under grazing alone, and we don't know if that's going to continue or not because we don't have the data in yet. But you can imagine that if you're trying to build carbon grazing alone, it will be a much quieter, slower process and probably take a great deal of focused attention on the part of the manager to, who, under, who has to understand what they're managing for. If they're managing for livestock, they may or may not increase carbon. It'll be a random event. If they're managing for soil carbon, it will probably happen if they understand the system they're working with. That's the challenge, though. We're actually, we don't, there's virtually no research on grazing as a carbon, soil carbon enhancement strategy. As you saw, almost everything that I showed you is pulled from the literature, incidental to other research that's been done. One of the things we're very much looking forward to in the Marine Carbon Project in terms of future research is how do we manage livestock? How do we manage grazing? for soil carbon sequestration. Right, so there's definitely the difference there. There's that. There's also the fact that compost is exogenous to the system, right? We're bringing carbon in. The only carbon available in that grazed context is the carbon in the atmosphere. So you're having to manage in situ dynamics when you're talking about grazing alone, which is which is the challenge for anybody who's managing rangeland with livestock. How do you do that? How do you do that? And, and, it, and yes, theoretically, it can be done. Personally, I feel I've done it. I've worked with livestock for many years and watched rangeland systems improve and soil carbon build. But can I tell you exactly how or why? Um, it's so much easier just to throw some carbon on the ground in the form of compost and boost the system up. But we also know that's not realistic. We really do have to get at the grazing question. Yeah, absolutely, and that's why the vineyards are the main users of compost in California right now, because they can afford to buy it. Um, the question is, is, is saving the planet affordable? 
we, we, our values are just a little bit skewed, right? So we have to start valuing carbon. And if we value carbon at its true worth, I think we're going to see the subsidies we need for compost will be coming in. And that's one of the things we're working on with the Carbon Project is, is trying to bring resources in to the land and to drive this change. Because ranchers have the smallest margin to fool with. Yeah, and it would be, you know, it would be crazy for society to put the burden of global climate change on what's essentially 2% of the population at this point, right? So, okay. So, just, so in terms of the increased biomass through the compost application, I, I understand uh, the managed grazing impact and the benefit of that, and I do understand the benefit of applying compost, but I'm wondering um, what have you seen in terms of perennial bunch grasses growing versus annual bunch grass right. or annual, annual grasses, plant yeah. grasses that's a that's a great increase. question and and it was something we were concerned about because um, especially in the sort of the native grass community there's a lot of concern about what are the implications of increasing the fertility of rangelands and are we going to drive a, a, a vegetation community change toward undesirable invasive species and that's why we're really advocating the use of this practice on grazed rangelands because the cows do a beautiful job of walking going in there and taking off that surplus growth so we did see a flush of exotic annuals coming up after a compost application we didn't it wasn't the seed wasn't in the compost the compost was seed, was viable seed free but the response in the soil seed bank was to flush these annuals out which brought them to where the cows could take care of them. And so at the end of the grazing season, there was no change in the species composition between the control plots and the grazed plots, I mean, the, and the treated plots. So essentially, our feeling is, one, we know the California soils have been very degraded through from 200 years of, of pretty bad management. Um, so personally, I'm not afraid of improving soil quality in California. Um, I think our native grasses probably had built some pretty fertile soils, and I think they'll do fine in fertile soils. But I do think we need to keep the grazing pressure in there to deal with the fact that we have all these new invasive species that are also part of the system now and need to be managed. Thank you, Jeff.